evening, everyone. Welcome to Vancouver Public Library. We are delighted to present this evening's discussion, panel, information session, Building the Eighth Fire. First, I'd like to acknowledge that we're on unceded Coast Salish territories. I also want to remind you to turn off any instrument that's going to be for buzz or make strange noises during the evening. We put on a lot of programs here at Central Library. If you're interested in the ones we have coming up over the summer, please pick up an events brochure from the table on your way out, or check our online events calendar, which is at apl.ca. Thank you again for coming, and now I turn it over to Anna Sewell. Hello. Hi. How's it going? Good. My name is Anna Sewell, and I'm Métis from the Cree Ojibwe and Iroquois Nations. I'm also French, Celtic, Pict, Welsh, and Dutch. So Heinz 57, that's my heritage. I'm really honored to be here, and I'll be the MC for the evening. I'm not one of the organizers, and I'd like to thank the organizers for organizing this event. Thank you. And uh, we are honored to have an elder here to welcome us. His name is Kevin B. So I'd like to invite Kevin B. He is how me how I knew I was going to do it wrong. How we miss? Yeah. Um, that's his that's his Indian name, and he's Kwakwakiwak uh, from Village Island, which is also known as uh, traditionally Mamank. Close. Uh, I don't even know my own languages, so <laughs> uh, I'd like to welcome, let's give a warm welcome to Kevin. Uh, my dear friends and relatives, Miss Feather was gifted to me four years ago at a retreat for survivors of residential school. This is the only thing that I hold very dear to me because I get to let it be used in a good way here in this audience and other places that I go to. So your MC is on her, her time. So she's asked her colleague to take it over and look after it while this Discuss it's going to happen, so I hand this over. With that, I ask you to stand and raise your hands. Just raise your hands in front of you and just think of your friends and family as we do this prayer to acknowledge the Coast Salish people as the librarian had done. Also, to ask the Sosilitan, the Musqueam. Squamish to thank them for allowing us to be here tonight to be on their traditional territory. We ask, we ask Creator to open our eyes and open our ears as we hear, listen to the speakers behind me. I show no disrespect to them, it's just that this is where it was. So please forgive me. And also to ask Creator to bless you for being here tonight. You've come a long ways on your canoes. You've gotten permission from the Coast Salish people to land your canoes here for this important gathering. Anywhere you go is important. Anywhere you go is always important. Remember that. The old people used to say, don't forget. But we have, we're here today. We ask Creator to thank you for coming. <laughs> so I like things to be a little bit different so I had asked if we could have it in a circle but it wasn't possible so instead what I'm going to invite everybody to do is make a circle with one hand make an X with the other hand. 
So, just a little bit of getting out of our heads and into our bodies and moving around a little bit. Um, I, I would really, really like to welcome all of our panelists. Thank you for being here. Let's have a big round of applause for our panelists. And a big round of applause for you for being here. Thank you. Because your voices are also really important to this discussion. Unfortunately, we won't have very much time at the end because we only have an hour and a half and we have many panelists. So I'm going to invite you, as we're going through, if you have questions or comments, to really prioritize them so that you get a chance to ask the most important ones first. Did you have your hand up? Oh, I was just waving to Kriana. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, just a little bit about tonight. How many people have seen Eighth Fire? Raise your hand if you've seen Eighth Fire. Awesome. Has anybody not seen Eighth Fire? Awesome. So we'll get some perspective from folks or give some perspective to folks as well who haven't seen it. Uh, Eighth Fire, the actual term, draws from an Anishinaabe pro prophecy that declares now is the time for Aboriginal peoples and the settler community to come together and build the Eighth Fire of Justice and Harmony. Uh, the show titles. Does anybody remember the show titles? Indigenous in the city. Whose land is it anyway? Like that show, you know? Whose line is it anyway? It's time and at the crossroad. So if you haven't seen the shows, that might give you a little bit of a sense of what the shows are about. The women who organized this event started a discussion group that was kind of like a book club. I wasn't part of it, but I, I had intended to go. I couldn't make it. Uh, and they did it this spring, and they wanted to debrief the show. Noticing that the group was primarily made up of non-Indigenous women, they wanted to keep the conversation going and to explore providing a forum for Indigenous voices and perspectives to be heard. Members of the group are active in grassroots organizations such as Strings of Justice, No One is Illegal, and formerly of the Indigenous Solidarity Network of Occupy Vancouver. So these are kind of the questions we wanted to pose tonight. And so for the panelists, if you want to take a listen also, they wanted to pose these questions. What do you see as the strengths and shortcomings of this series? What is the state of relations between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people in Canada today? And where do we go from here? Uh, at this panel event and facilitated discussion tonight, we're going to be hearing from a diverse group of Aboriginal leaders, artists, and thinkers about their perspectives on CBC's Eighth Fire and their thoughts on building more ethical and just relations between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. I'm really excited. How are you? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's get to it. Enough talking from me. So um, we had asked if Winona would be willing to go first. Are you comfortable with that? <laughs> So I have a little bio for Winona. So Winona Victor is Tulwik, right? Yeah, I got it. From the Skokale community. She's married to Ernie Victor from Chim or Palalt. Uh, and together they have three children, daughter Jade and two sons, Justice and Alexis. Winona is currently completing her PhD in Indigenous Governments and Self-Determination at Simon Fraser University. Winona teaches Indigenous Studies at the University of Fraser Valley. Let's hear it for Winona. through that tactic. She's like, stay, sit down, because she doesn't want to get up. <laughs> okay. Uh, the reason why I wanted to get up and speak is because I want to practice introducing myself in my indigenous language, which is Halkmelem. So um, I'm just going to take about 45 seconds to do that. A slat siaya siyalakwa siam 
qui custam tals qui. Talitza qua chawek casta skalkel. So what I've said in Halkamalam is good evening, my dear friends, my leaders, and all my ancestors. My name is Kwikwistam, a name that I carry for the Stalo people. And I am from the Chawek tribe, uh, namely the Skalkil community, located in what we now call Chilliwack, British Columbia. OK, because we were told that we have eight minutes, I took notes, because of course eight minutes isn't that long to talk about all the different dynamics um, and issues that are brought up in the Eighth Fire series. So I've just quickly made some bullet form notes that I'm just going to read through so I don't go over my time and, and then I imagine they'll uh, be expanded upon or with the other panelists, however that's going to go. I'm sure it'll all work out just fine. Also, before I start, I also wanted to make a correction about the poster up at the top of the stairs. It has me listed as a doctor already, which I am not. So I just wanted to make sure I have not successfully defended my dissertation yet. So I know people are just chomping at the bit to get me uh, with that title. And it will eventually happen, but all in due process. I have not successfully defended uh, my dissertation yet. I just wanted to make that known. Okay, what I liked about the 8th Fire uh, CBC series were, uh, first and foremost, was the production of the series in general. I don't know a lot about how um, TV programs are put together and how they're produced, but just from somebody who watches a lot of TV, because that's how I shut my mind off, the production of it, I thought, <laughs> was phenomenal. I liked the, the scenery, I liked the visuals, I liked the, uh, the music. And I especially liked all the good-looking Indians that were presented throughout uh, the series. So I had a great appreciation for all of that. I also liked having the fact that there were positive role models and all those positive images being presented on the TV screen. That, for me, was a first. Of course, we're used to seeing all those negative images, all the negative stereotypes that, as Canadian citizens, we're, we're fully aware of. Those tend to be plastered all over the TV uh, quite often. So this was a nice change to be able to see the positive role models and the positive uh, images being reflected on my TV screen. I also like that it gets people talking about uh, extremely important issues. And it brings some of the issues that I think over a certain period of time have been uh, perhaps pushed to the back burner. This series helped to bring some of those issues to the forefront again and to get people talking about them. One of the parts that I especially liked, being a, an instructor in First Nation Studies, I imagine some can, can relate, is the Aboriginal 101 interview that occurred on the streets across Canada, where one of the, um, the hosts of the series, not Wab, uh, Wab Canoe, but uh, the female host, I can't recall her name right now, went out on the streets and started asking the Canadian public certain questions about Indigenous peoples. And the answers, or lack thereof, I thought were very telling, but it was done in such a way to bring up some of the humour um, and the consistent fact that across Canada, people tend not to know a lot about Indigenous people. So that was one of, the, uh, the favorite, one of my favourite portions of the series. I also like that the series can be used as a teacher's tool, meaning I can bring in um, either entire segments or portions of some of the, the series that were done and bring them into the university classroom to be used as a teacher's tool, as in getting students to start talking about the issues that are brought up. And that can include um, focusing on some of the issues that might not necessarily be the focus of that segment or of that series, but that are brought up through the people that are being interviewed or people that are being talked to throughout the series. Um, problems and things that are missing. Um, one of the issue or one of the problems or things that I found to be missing is in terms of who are we speaking to. Now, obviously, with uh, Wab Canoe being the the host of the series, I found that he speaks generally to a non-indigenous audience. But I understand why he's doing that because he's tra he's trying to get the dialogue going. He's trying to get the conversation started. So he's speaking primarily uh, to a non-indigenous audience. Uh, which, which I understand why, but I would also like for him to speak to me uh, once in a while, too. The other thing that I found missing throughout the, the series of documentaries, all four um, that have produ been produced so far, are the voices of the grandmothers. I saw uh, two elder women 
um, perhaps for a minute or two in one of the series in terms of teaching some of the lost Indigenous youth that are now finding their way back to their roots, to their culture, uh, via, I believe, rap music and other uh, forms that they're using uh, to give expression to who they are as Indigenous peoples. Um, they had also spent some time lost, I believe, in drugs, alcohol, uh, perhaps some cr criminal behavior, I'm not too sure. But the series set them up, or introduced them to two elder women, and they did get to speak with these elder women and learn from them uh, as part of the documentary. Other than that, the series I found lacked the voice of the Indigenous grandmothers. So that's something I would like to see more of. Oh my goodness. Okay, and then <laughs> um, the other issue that I took with it is that it assumes that capitalism and a free market economy is something that all Indigenous peoples are aspiring to achieve. The focus on economics being our way out um, I thought should really be presented as one of our ways out, not the way out. Important steps that we need to go, uh, important steps to move forward in improving our relationships. The, one of the issues is that past harms need to be acknowledged and fixed. Um, another issue is before we can move forward, we need to, and I think everybody at this point is beginning to agree, we definitely need to abolish the Indian Act. Uh, it has, yes, it has to go. It is all about the annihilation of Indigenous peoples. It is nothing about Indigenous empowerment. But in the meantime, while we're waiting for the Indian Act to be abolished, I think as Canadians as citizens, there are certain things that we can start doing as individuals. And this is in terms of decolonization. So as Canadian individuals, we can begin to decolonize ourselves mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. And this is something we don't need to wait for the colonial governments to catch up with. It's something that we can start doing even while the Indian Act is still in force and effect. We need to begin to hold each other um, accountable for our own responsibilities. Meaning Indigenous peoples, uh, we do tend to hold the non-Indigenous peoples accountable, but I think also non-Indigenous peoples can also start feeling welcome in holding Indigenous peoples uh, accountable for our own responsibilities as well. Um, another issue, or another thing that can help improve the relationship between Indigenous peoples and non-Indigenous peoples is for non-Indigenous peoples to quit speaking for us. Right. and to quit appropriating our culture and our ways of knowing without our consultation or our consent. And lastly, one of the things that we can achieve in terms of moving our relationship forward, whether you're Indigenous or not Indigenous, is to know who you are and where you come from. And I'll end it there. Hi, 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 hi. Thank you, Anona. So uh, next up, we have Dr. Glenn Coulthard, and uh, he has a PhD at the University of Victoria, is a member of the Yellow Knives, the Dene First Nation, and an assistant professor in the First Nation Studies program in the Department of Political Science. Glenn has written and published numerous articles and chapters in the areas of indigenous thought and politics, contemporary political theory, and radical social and political thought. Glenn is currently writing a book on Indigenous peoples and recognition politics in Canada. He lives in Vancouver, Coast Salish territories. Let's hear it for Dr. Glenn. Thanks. Um, thank you for the invitation to be here to Aaron and the other organizers uh, for inviting me. I'd like to acknowledge that we are on unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish. Also like to acknowledge uh, the strength that has been demonstrated in the last few weeks by uh, members of the Musqueam First Nation in their, their own land of uncertainty. As uh, somebody who works at UBC, I feel particularly uh, like I have a responsibility to acknowledging that and saying thank you for allowing me to work. Um, so what's good and bad about this show? I, um, I thought that it started off all right. I thought that indigeneity in the city or indigenous peoples in the city um, teased out some of the complexities of uh, that uh, Aboriginal people navigate in urban context, which is 
obviously a uh, quite a reality um, in our present context. And I'm going to pretty much stop at that and then just focus on some of the more problematic aspects of the show. Uh, particularly the second show, which is, uh, deals with the land question and who owns this land and uh, how might we think about better relationships with it and with our non-Indigenous um, um, neighbors now. So first I want to start off by just by providing a brief definition of what I understand the problem to be and that uh, and that is the violence is associated with an ongoing settler colonialism which is hell-bent on uh, maintaining access to indigenous people's lands for the purposes of capitalist development state formation and settlement so that has been the burden uh, placed on this relationship um, starting or really kind of crystallizing um, beginning roughly in the 1800s but kind of changes geographically across Canada. So it's not the burden that my community faced until the post-war period, for instance, up in the Northwest Territories. So it's been a question about land and gaining land. And in doing so, um, beginning again in that turn of the century around 1800s, it became consolidated into a piece of legislation known as the Indian Act. Uh, the Indian Act governed pretty much every aspect of status Indian people's lives, which was a creation of the Act itself, or the Acts that it eventually kind of jumbled into one. And, um, and it has been oriented around gaining access to Indigenous people's lands, and it does this through, of course, various forms of legislative dispossession. It was profoundly sexist and racist in its structure, and it is in existence almost as it was when it started um, uh, back in the late 1800s, but again, it was the um, culmination or amalgamation of a number of previous policies. So we have this understanding, at least, that, um, that colonialism has been this kind of structured violence uh, geared towards the dispossession of indigenous peoples of their land. And it really kind of crystallized in this piece of shit legislation that has governed our lives for so long. Unfortunately now though, and this is where I'll get to talk briefly about the show, is that we still, as natives and, and allies of, of native peoples, see the Indian Act as the epitome of what colonialism is today. We really kind of put a lot of, like, like we heard today, respectfully and, and with good due, like, uh, for reasons, is that we have to abolish any sort of uh, a society that that uh, that prides itself, or would at least like uh, attempt to make a claim that it's about justice, freedom, equality, and so on, would have to do away with such a piece of legislation. But it was a piece of legislation among many practices, which was oriented towards an end, and that's to dispossess indigenous peoples of their land base. That's what it's. It was just a means to facilitate that end. Today, there are plenty more means to facilitate that and at play, and economics is one of the primary ones that we need to deal with. So when you have somebody like uh, or Chief Clarence Louie claiming that uh, business or uh, market penetration is the best way to facilitate reconciliation in the contemporary period, you are actually participating in your own subjugation, your own domination, and the own exploitation of your lands and your resources. So you see this uh, kind of crystallize in the Eighth Fire as one of the uh, one of the ways out of colonialism when it's actually uh, totally consistent with the logic of settler colonialism and gaining access to indigenous people's lands and labors. labor. We also see it arise in the uh, relatively recent Crown First Nation um, meeting between First Nations leaders and the federal government um, that was following the, the Ottawa Opiscat um, shenanigans um, where, where the Prime Minister eventually agreed to, to meet with a bunch of resentful and very angry Native people about the economic conditions that we still live in on our reserves and in the cities. And um, so at that point in time, uh, we have a bunch of First Nations, again, leaders rightfully declaring the end or a demand to the end of governance under the sexist and racist Indian Act. And Stephen Harper says that we can't go about doing that because it's so thoroughly entrenched 
in the relationship that to actually remove it would just leave a big hole. And so it's saying something about Canada that uh, just because uh, getting rid of something um, as, uh, as racist and sexist is a bit difficult that we're just not going to do it. And then he claimed, but there's a number of other ways in which we can reconcile, and those are through uh, non-Indian Act means. And my claim here today, and with reference to the, uh, the Eighth Fire, is that those non-Indian Act means are precisely through the forceful and co-optive integration of indigenous peoples into uh, market relationships, which are profoundly racist and sexist and, uh, and uh, structured along those lines. And my final example of this would be um, our, your uh, premier, Christy Clark's recent declaration that in order to facilitate economic development, uh, non-renewable resource economic development in this province, that she proposes to establish or facilitate, I'm not sure what she has in mind, 10 non-treaty agreements within the province in the next few years. So this means instead of going through the process of establishing a land claim with First Nations peoples whose lands you're on, who have title to those lands which have never been extinguished through the historical treaty process, um, she wants to expedite the purpose of that um, that process from the federal government and British Columbia's perspective and the purpose has always been stated explicitly to gain more access to indigenous people's lands um, in order to establish certainty for the purpose of economic development and settlement. So that process established in 1973 has turned out to be a little bit too slow um, for industry and state in this province so she wants to skip it or at least supplement it by establishing political relationships which they claim to be about reconciliation directly or just slightly mediated with, indi or with industry. At least when you enter into a land claim agreement it has some sort of constitutional protection under the Constitution Act. But this is just pure relationships with capitalism oriented around the exploitation of indigenous people's lands and indigenous people's labor, and that is the definition of settler colonialism. Thank you so much. That's the worst part of this job, cutting people off. <laughs> it's over, you're done. Thank you very much. So uh, next up, we have Okay, I gotta get I gotta get down for this one because there's so many things I gotta pronounce right. I'm really excited, so bear with me. <clears throat> I'd like to welcome Ian Kiplas Kaplet. He is of the nine allied Simshin Nation tribes of Laplanks, Gitendo, right? Yeah. <clears throat> or Blackfish or Gisputwara. Did I get it? Clan from the house of Gamiam. Yeah. <laughs> His undergraduate degree is in First Nations Studies with a political science major minor at Vancouver Island University and is now pursuing a master's in Indigenous Governance at the University of Victoria with a focus on re-establishing individual and community connection to the land through resurgence of Simshin culture, including traditional name and uses resurgence, la language revitalization through experiential learning and story work, and re restoration of ceremonial practices and spaces. Welcome. said <laughs> pretty much uh, yeah we like I don't really have anything good to say about the eighth fire at all um, I think it was just uh, capitalist propaganda um, meant to make native people feel a little bit better about being colonized and had genocide inflicted upon them and the imperialist paradigm being shoved down our throats yet again uh, through television this time so feel so much better. Um, yeah, like I don't, the issue that I have with it is that it just blends itself in so much to the kind of 
dominant idea which has found our way found its way into our communities and that is that the economic development model to health is the way to go and um, you know I don't agree with that I think that uh, our health has been and always will be inextricably tied to our lands and if our lands are not healthy there's no possibility we can be and I think that in reality we all better get hip to that idea really soon and without actually protecting that knowledge and continuing with that fundamental principle in our lives we're just heading towards a very steep cliff and uh, the CBC is now facilitating that and has co-opted very many people and spent a lot of money into presenting this propaganda in order to create the illusion that yeah, we can get all healthy and we can integrate ourselves together under Euro-Western values and you know, all get along as we go over the cliff, basically. So yeah, eight fire, right? Uh, it's it's uh, Anishinaabe too, which is kind of interesting, um, just because it's like, it is the kind of indigenous way of being that is being put out there too, so it seems to be applicable in Coast Salish homelands as well as it is in Mi'kmaq or, or whichever you would have. So, I mean, I think one of the most telling things that, for me, uh, that I've seen in that, in that series was that um, Romeo uh, Seganch, I think his, his last name is, he was talking about uh, one of the communities in, in, uh, around James Bay and about the economic uh, prosperity that they enjoyed. And uh, I guess they had made some deal with some development company, I think it was over a dam or something like that. And uh, he was talking about how there's still suicide and there's still uh, alcohol abuse and drug abuse and, and all of that. And he just couldn't figure it out. <laughs> like, to me, it's like, whoa, man, you gotta go back to Aboriginal 101 or whatever, you know, and just like, except the fact that the land is hurting so your people are. They cannot get to what sustains them in a spiritual way, in a physical way. They can't go to in a social way. Like this is, this is all the basics about how to integrate yourself into a social framework. You spend time together. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you spend time together and you actually do things and that is what is missing from these economic development models and everything like that. What you're doing is going to spend time away from your family to make money so you can buy a bunch of stuff and uh, somehow that's going to make you better. Well, you know, we're suffering from very many layers of colonialism. We're suffering from spending time away from our homes and in rooms like this, you know, like this whole situation right here is structurally violent. We're sitting here in a way that we're talking to you like as if you're somehow beneath us. And physically, you're like that right now to me. But you're not, right? We should be having this discussion all over the place and in groups of people where we each have an equal voice.